Cool. Well, welcome everybody. Um, as we do in, I can't even call it Mendocino time because I think that it's just a sort of a new way that we roll. We're going to give people a few minutes to arrive. Um, and I really, I have stellar sea lions in my background. They're being very quiet, calm, cool, and collected and beautiful. But um, stellar sea lions are one of my favorite creatures. And we have something in common here tonight in that the Marine Mammal Center and the Noyo Center for Marine Science and the folks that are studying stellar sea lions, all three are supported by the North Coast Brewery's Stellar IPA. So if you really wanna add a little flavor and sparkle to this science talk tonight, go ahead and grab yourself a Stellar IPA. And thanks to the people at North Coast Brewery for um, kicking in. Uh, to these incredible science organizations that um, are, are here in our mix. Um, or get yourself a cup of tea. I want to be fully awake and alert for Cara's talk tonight and absorb every single little ounce of information that she has. Um, I myself, Sarah Grimes, have been a volunteer for Marine Mammal Center for almost 20 years. And my paycheck is when I get to hear uh, the vet from the Marine Mammal Center talk. And that's always been a thing before COVID. The Marine Mammal Center, when they did the training up here, they'd bring a vet up and the veterinarian would give us a kind of a year in review. And I said, that is the paycheck. So it's pretty exciting that we have Cara here um, and welcome everybody. I see Allison Louie is here from Up and Humble. Super cool and um, nice bunch of people. Thanks for joining us. And tonight's speaker, Cara Fields, is one of my true heroes. Um, and I really mean that. Um, she is a woman in science. She has um, done had incredible experiences. Um, she studied at UC Davis, and she's been in um, I'm not going to read the whole thing that Cara's had in a lot of amazing experiences, um, PhD and uh, in veterinary science and studied like even how elephant seals dive and deal with that incredible pressure and how they, you know, so way beyond my um, understanding other than, wow, that's cool. <laughs> um, uh, and yeah, I also as a mammal rescuer for 20 years, picking up those animals and being deeply curious about what happens to them when they get down there. And my answer, my go-to answer when somebody says, what's wrong with it? Um, I say, you know, <laughs> I'm not even going to try to diagnose in the field. I'm going to send this animal down to the Marine Mammal Center and let those veterinarians figure that one out because I don't know, but they do. And uh, some very cool science. And it's also one more thing, um, when you see a rescue happening from the Marine Mammal Center, um, you know, it's not just about rescuing a marine mammal, it's about learning about what's going on for these marine mammals um, and diving deeper and getting a better understanding of these mysterious marine mammals, mammals in the ocean. Um, so let's hand it over to Cara Fields and thank her so much for giving us this evening and giving of her busy, busy time. So I'm handing it over to you, Ms. Cara. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Sarah and Peggy and everybody at Noyo and all of you. It's really an honor to be with you tonight. And um, uh, working with rain mammals is for me, it's, it's aquatic animals, really. It's such a privilege. And, and um, I am thrilled to say that this work has never once ever been boring. Um, and for, for somebody who loves science and animals, I am just incredibly lucky um, and have been so fortunate to be able to work with them uh, for my life. Um, and it's not always easy and it's, it's not always pretty, um, but it's incredibly rewarding. Um, so tonight I thought that I would share some, uh, some current marine mammal stranding events uh, in the Eastern Pacific or here in California and up and down our coast. Um, and as Sarah noted, I'm a, the medical director at the Marine Mammal Center. 
And I just added a couple slides in here about um, stranding because I know that Sarah and some of some others of you are also part of our stranding network um, and are some of our responders, but maybe not everybody um, may not be familiar with stranded animals quite as much. So, uh, so I thought I would start by giving just a little bit of background there. Um, so just to just as a definition, what is a stranded marine mammal? Um, and this is from NOAA Fisheries. Uh, so it refers to any dead marine mammal on a beach or floating or any live cetacean on a beach or in water so shallow, it's unable to free itself to resume normal activity. And there are some cetaceans that do strand um, to feed. So that's not quite the same. They, they launch themselves into very shallow water on shore, chasing fish and so forth. Um, so those animals, that's, that's fairly normal activity. And then of course, any pinnipeds, so seal or sea lion, which is unable or unwilling to leave the shore um, because of illness or poor health, injury or illness or poor health. Um, so that's the basic definition. Of course, this also applies to sea turtles. Um, we also care for and respond to sea turtles at the Marine Mammal Center. Um, we don't wanna leave them completely out. Technically it applies to sharks and other things too, but we'll stick with marine mammals for today. Um, so in our many years, uh, we, sorry, my cat has joined me. Our many years, we've, we've sort of defined um, to categorize the different reasons for why marine mammals strand. And this is both true here in California, the West Coast, and really all throughout the world. Um, and we try to kind of have these big general categories so that when we get questions about what are the main reasons that marine mammals wash ashore, we can give some generalizations. And many times these animals strand with more than one major problem. So, but we wanted to have some general groups to, to lump them into. Um, so these are the main reasons that most marine mammal strand um, here and around different parts of the country. So malnutrition is, is far and away the most common, but there's usually a reason, an additional reason for that. Um, for in the case of young animals separated from their mothers prematurely is a huge one like this little harbor seal pup up here. Um, there are a lot of toxins out there. Um, some of those are, are oils or pollutants. Some of them are natural toxicities like biotoxins. Um, infection is a very common thing, whether it's bacterial, viral, or other cancer, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Lots of human interaction, whoopsie, types of things, uh, such as entanglement and unfortunately gunshot. And this is an x-ray from the side view of a sea lion who was shot in the head, um, unfortunately, and you can see the little very bright white little spots all throughout, and those are buckshot. Um, and then entanglements, you can see like this little sea lion down here. And then of course, natural, um, natural predation. So shark bites and uh, conspecific bites. So from other sea lions or seals or whatever, are also not uncommon. So those are some of our main reasons why we see these animals wash ashore. And to be fair, there's a, a lot of people that question whether or not it's appropriate to rehabilitate stranded marine mammals. So some of the big concerns are that if we um, rehabilitate these animals, we can in introduce novel pathogens from our terrestrial animals, for example, or even us, that could cause an epidemic and even potentially wipe out a large number of a population or a species. Um, there are endemic disease dynamics. Um, so diseases that are just within a certain population. So maybe sea lions, but maybe we don't see them in some other species. And rehabilitation may alter these dynamics of these diseases. So it may affect um, the age or the prevalence of which a disease might be seen or in a young animal's case, it may, um, they may not have an immune system that's prepared to cope with something that they might get exposed to from another animal that's undergoing rehabilitation. Um, rehabilitation of these hosts can alter pathogens. And a big example of that and a big concern certainly is antibiotic resistance. I would suggest that as humans, oops, so sorry, we use a lot more antibiotics um, in ourselves and often flush them down the toilet when we're done with them, which is also, not a, a great way to treat our antibiotics. Um, so that's something that we're very mindful of when animals undergo rehabilitation, but there is evidence that um, bacteria can develop a resistance to antibiotics if used heavily. And then of course there's the, there's a, the sort of go-to is that the animals that strand are, are often the ones that are least fit to survive. And that's a natural progression of things. And certainly, um, you know, there's a, a lot to be said for letting nature take its course. 
But what I'm hoping to, to share with you today is that unfortunately, humans have a massive effect on this nature take its course phenomenon or thought. So, um, so I'm gonna share some of those stories with you. On the other hand, there are a lot of reasons to, um, to benefit and a lot that we can learn from rehabilitation. So there's a lot of scientific work that can be done. Um, a lot of times we are offered the opportunity to detect novel infectious diseases and novel infectious agents that might be difficult or impossible to detect and define in dead animals. An example of that is influenza um, and even our current pandemic, coronavirus. Um, we are still, it's still not 100% a guarantee where it came from. And we're still not sure what the effects are and whether or not we can transmit it to other animals. That has been shown. We have indeed transmitted coronavirus, COVID-19 to some animals. So there's definitely, but they, we might not be able to detect that if they're dead. Um, climate change um, has huge effects on ecosystems. And that is gen generally quite human driven as well. Um, so in addition to that, there's, there's a, a huge effort and desire to understand sort of the one health perspective, which is the, the, it's the, the merger really of human and animal health and how that all fits together and how we influence each other's environment and health. Um, rehabilitation gives us the opportunity in many cases to either define or correct and or correct our, our effects, our anthropogenic effects on these animals. And given how extensively in the last couple hundred years we've hunted um, many species to extinction or near extinction um, and continue to have a major effects on these species, um, this is definitely a good reason to uh, continue with rehabilitation. We also can learn about novel treatments and responses and be able to apply these to endangered species. And there are ample numbers of those. Certainly we have animal welfare concerns, uh, especially when you consider anything that might've been associated with a human interaction. And this provides wonderful opportunities for education, outreach and specialty training. So at the Marine Mammal Center, we um, accept veterinary students and residents and veterinary technician interns and international veterinarians and scientists and researchers from all over the place to try to, we have such a high case though that we want to teach other people how to respond and care for these animals as well. And then also pay that forward and teach the next generation about what's going on with these animals, um, as well as some of our older folks, because I'm certainly sh sharing some of these things with my mom and she's frequently surprised by things that we see. So just as a little, a quick little background, the Marine Mammal Center is, um, we are your stranding center. Uh, we cover 600 miles of California coastline. California coast is about 840 miles total. So it's a pretty big chunk that we cover. And whoops, I seem to have drawn this twice, but you can see over here on the map, um, we're <laughs> completely, I, I must've moved it. Um, so we're here, the Sausalito headquarters here, is, here in San Francisco. And then, as you know, we respond from about Mendocino all the way down to San Luis Obispo. Um, so it's a pretty long network, pretty wide um, region. We also built a, a, a purpose-built hospital for the critically endangered Hawaiian monk seals, and that's based in Kona in Hawaii. And we opened that hospital in 2014 as there was a, a large need that was identified to help that species in particular. Um, with the exception of the pandemic, <laughs> over the last about five, six, seven years, we've um, in, admitted over 800 animals every single year um, with our peak admissions in 2015 of over 1,800 marine mammals. And that's actually more than any other facility in the world over our 45, 46 years in existence. So it's a, it's a pretty massive place. Um, we've grown a lot as well. We have 100 staff now. Um, when I started just seven years ago, we had, had less than half that number. Um, and most importantly, probably is our 1300 plus volunteers. And our volunteers are really what make our ability to respond and care for these animals possible. Our volunteers are everyone from people who respond to a call for an animal on the beach, um, drive the animals and transport them around, take phone calls even from people who are calling in whether it's a real <laughs> stranding or not, um, and uh, uh, docents at the center, literally every, every walk and every aspect of, of our, our care and response to animals is driven by our volunteers. 
So we could absolutely not do what we do without them. And I am very proud to have been a volunteer uh, for seven years, quite a few years ago. So a quick little background. I grew up in Santa Cruz, California. I was incredibly fortunate to grow up here on our beautiful California coast. And um, absolutely that spoiled, if not, well, maybe not spoiled, that primed me for the desire to work with our aquatic animals and along our beautiful coastline in future. Um, I went to the University of California Davis for undergraduate and I majored in physiology. And my best time I had as an undergraduate was spent at Bodega Bay Marine Lab, which is uh, UC Davis's marine laboratory uh, where we got to do these very in-depth classes in marine biology and ecology. And I, I absolutely love that didn't involve marine mammals and that was fine. I was thrilled just to work with any aquatic species. And then um, I took a little bit of a gap in between to work and travel and um, applied to vet school and didn't get in and then did the whole kind of, what was me, what am I gonna do with my life? Um, so I actually started graduate school first at Davis and then got accepted into veterinary school. So I ended up doing those two programs together, um, which is not necessarily for everybody, but I had help. And part of a huge part of that was my, my interest in diving physiology. And, and that's really what drove my knowledge of and a desire to continue to work with the Marine Mammal Center. So the Marine Mammal Center, um, we've taken a lot of elephant seals. They are amazing diving mammals. And um, I was able to work with uh, Dr. Francis Gulland, who is one of my life's heroes and uh, many, many other incredible people, many of who are still there. Um, to complete my dissertation and, and study the effects of pressure on elephant seal blood platelets, um, which is kind of cool and a whole nother talk. Um, and then I was also very fortunate to go on to have some really incredible experiences at different parts of the country at Mystic Aquarium in Connecticut, where I studied brucella, which is a bacterial infection in marine mammals. And um, I worked in Louisiana and New Orleans and happened to be there during the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in 2010 and got my share of um, care of oiled wildlife during that time, uh, followed by a few years at Georgia Aquarium. And then I've been very fortunate to be the uh, staff at, followed by medical director here starting in October of 2014. And then a few years ago, I also passed the American College of Zoological Medicine board certification in aquatic animal medicine. So that's a, a specialty position. So um, I'm one of about only 30 people or so, I think in the country that have that specialty. So um, basically all this tells you that I'm never done learning <laughs> and I'm really overeducated and I finished 27th grade. So um, that's, that's something, right? All right. <laughs> so enough about me and the Marine Mammal Center. Um, so I just wanted to talk about a couple things that are going on currently and in, in our world that you may or may not be super aware of um, because they're always fascinating and things are always changing with our stranded marine mammals. So we'll talk about some gray whales and some Guadalupe fur seals and sea lion cancer and some sea otters. So some of this, I'm just doing a little bit of background but probably all of you know a lot of this already. So please forgive me if I, I'm certainly not trying to insult anyone's intelligence, just wanted to provide a little background. Um, I know everybody knows all about the gray whale, our, our local whale species, and that they were nearly extinct um, from commercial whaling at, in the 1900s. Uh, so our population around uh, pre-whaling times was estimated around 30,000 whales, and following whaling, it was reduced to about 1 to 2,000. Fortunately, the eastern population, our population, has recovered quite well and was estimated to be about 26,000 uh, just a few years ago in 2016. Note the asterisks there, I'll come back to that. However, the Western population around the Western Pacific Rim, so Japan, Russia, et cetera, has not recovered and they are still critically endangered with only less than 200 or so whales. Wow, sorry, I don't know if I put this on an auto timer, I apologize. Um, and gray whales are very distinctive. You guys know that they're kind of the older model, one of the older model cetaceans. Um, they're about 50 feet in length. They are baleen whales, but they don't have those big, huge throat pleats. They just have a few um, throat, throat grooves. And of course they're gray whales because they're modeled gray, very, very um, makes total sense. Um, uh, the other big thing that you guys will also know is about their massive migration that they undertake. Um, so I, very, I stole this from lovely uh, site on the internet from the San Luis Obispo 
education that traces these animals' incredible progress down the coast uh, that they migrate twice a year, um, which accomplishes about 10,000 mile or so migration. So as you probably recall, they have their calves in Baja in the nice warm waters, San Ignacio Lagoon in particular, I have not been there yet. Bucket list, <laughs> definitely want to go. Um, and then once they calve, um, they start restart their northern migration up to the Arctic feeding grounds. So most of the time, historically at least, they do not tend to eat along the way, although that's very interesting that we have documented now that along the way, a number of these gray whales are actually feeding as they go. And we've seen them feeding right here in San Francisco Bay. Um, so that's kind of cool. And, um, and then they'll repeat that again. So they usually don't feed, except of course the calves are nursing during that whole time. And they can double their weight in their first three months. So you can imagine the energy burden that that's putting on mom. Um, and once they get up there and start feeding, those calves will wean by the end of that first year. So obviously there's a lot of threats to whales and many of these unfortunately remain human induced threats. Uh, vessel strikes are very real and quite common. And there's, um, I think you guys had some really, a really cool, uh, some talks with large whales recently you know, over the last year um, that covered, I think a little bit of vessel strikes, but more, most, more importantly, or more um, in depth, the entanglement and the, the problems with marine debris um, that those pose for our whales. Of course, ocean pollution, both chemical and noise, um, are very, very major issues for these whales. And then, of course, a lack of prey availability, um, whether that's human-induced or a natural um, changes in fluctuations in their prey uh, that sometimes remains to be established. So a, an unusual mortality event, as again, defined by uh, NOAA Fisheries under the Marine Mammal Protection Act, which came was enacted in 1972, is defined as a stranding, and this is of not just one animal, a stranding, so a large stranding, um, that is unexpected, uh, involves a significant die-off of any marine mammal population and demands an immediate response. So that is the very basic definition of an unusual mortality event. And this working group on marine mammal uh, mortality events was established in 1991. And it, it, it basically, it brings in these experts from scientific and academic institutions, from conservation organizations, state and federal agencies, and possibly some of you, maybe some of you have been on a, a UME committee or task force or in a working group um, and have helped uh, study and understand what's happening with these. And I didn't list them here because it's very lengthy, but there's seven main criteria um, that are used to evaluate whether or not an unusual mortality event should be declared for marine mammals strandings. So based on this very recently updated um, pie chart, you can see that this gray area, almost half of unusual mortality events have not had a cause established for them, which is a real bummer. And that's not for lack of trying in most cases. Um, sometimes maybe it's for lack of resources, but in all actuality, sometimes we never do find a cause. The other half the time, they've been assigned a fairly general category as to cover what those major causes of these events are. You can see here about 14% are due to infectious disease. And quite frankly, a lot of that infectious disease is more bilivirus, which is you might uh, recognize as a uh, type of distemper virus, very similar to measles in humans. And it causes very severe disease in cetaceans in particular, and also mass die-offs of seals in the North Sea. We do not have more bilivirus in our pinnipeds here on the west coast of the US. It is endemic or commonly occurs on the east coast. Um, but in the North Sea, we see every uh, maybe 10 years or so big die-offs of harbor seals in particular. And then biotoxins accounts for about 18% of these um, UMEs, and remember, this is around the US, so this is just for the United States. Um, but the two big ones that we see have been domoic acid, which is on our coast primarily, and brevitoxin, which is primarily around the Atlantic coast, especially around Florida. And occasionally, I think there has been one or two attributed to saxitoxin, which is a different um, kind of biotoxin produced by a different algae, um, which is Alexandrium species. And then the smaller green slice here, 14% is also due to ecological factors. 
So uh, possibly warming water temperatures, other things like that. And then you can see a small number of them are also due to human interaction. So there's a lot of different causes of UMEs, but I think the scary part is that even though many have been investigated, we still have not come up with reasons for half of why we see these. So back in 1999 to 2000, there was suddenly an increase, a huge increase of stranding of gray whales in Mexico during the winter of 1999. And remember that time the population had recovered, it was around 26,000 or so. I think actually that might be 23, but anyways, it had recovered, it was doing fine. And a lot of these whales were washing up um, along our shores during their northern migration. So in July of that year, uh, NOAA declared an unusual mortality event because there was an unusual behavior that the whales were exhibiting. Many of them were very thin and they were stranding in unusual locations. So not unusual for gray whales to wash up on our shore, whether they're going north or south during their migration, if it's like a ship strike or a poor nutrition or you know, something like that or a predation. But this was a huge increase in the numbers that were being seen. Unfortunately, and in that year in 2000, there were actually only three necropsies that were that out of the ones that were completed where a cause of death could truly be determined. And that was out of almost uh, 650 animals. So that's, that's quite low. Um, and those were included two juveniles and a yearling. Uh, and those were animals who were found to be starving. So suffering from malnutrition. So unfortunately, a lot remains unknown about that event. Um, and it is postulated that starvation may have been secondary to changes in ice distribution, uh, affecting access of these whales to feeding regions that the location of prey may have changed um, or that the population level was at the peak of what the environment can support. And sometimes people refer to that as carrying capacity. Um, and maybe with these younger animals, there was less success for these inexperienced foragers. So fast forward 20 years to 2019, and we started seeing huge numbers of gray whales dying off again in January of 2019, starting in Mexico. And a few months later, an uh, unusual mortality event was declared in May of 2019. And right here, just literally right here, within about 30 miles of where I'm sitting right now, we had 13 gray whales um, that washed ashore that we did necropsies on. But this was happening all up and down the entire coast. So by the end of, um, by September of 2019, there are over 200 mortalities, at least. And 81 were reported in Mexico, 121 in the US, all of our states, and then 10 in Canada. And they were a very mixed bag of age and sex. Um, so this graph um, borrowed from NOAA shows you the difference in gray whale strandings between uh, in California, Oregon, Washington, Alaska, so in the US, in 2019, which is the orange bars versus the 18-year uh, average. So between 2001, after that previous event, to 2018. So. You can see that you know almost every year in between that there were maybe one, two, three, four, or five gray whale strandings. But then here in March, April, May, June, July, you saw um, over 20, uh, 15 to 20, almost 30 strandings um, during those months. That's a lot of whale <laughs> to be washing ashore. And remember, that's just in the US. That doesn't count Canada and Mexico as well. So this graph, also borrowed from NOAA, um, shows where they stranded. So the little yellow dots here are Mexico. Um, Canada is up here in purple. And then of course the US is green. But remember what our coast looks like. There is a lot of very inaccessible places along not just our coast here, but even harder further north up along the Canadian coastline. And it's much sparsely populated there as well. Um, and look at how many were reported for Alaska. Again, talk about sparsely populated. That's a lot of animals um, to be dying. And so there's a very good chance there were far more than were actually documented. So because of these, we've been um, encouraged, NOAA has supported us all to go out and do necropsies. But as you probably heard from Sarah and others over the years, it's no small deal to do a really thorough and full whale necropsy. Um, it takes a lot of effort. And you can see all these people pulling on the sign um, Honestly, this was completely futile. We did nothing for this whale to try to get it closer to shore, absolutely nothing. We rolled it in the waves just a little bit. Um, it's kind of dangerous to be doing whale necropsies in the water when waves and tides are splashing on you and whales are rolling back and forth and can squish you. Um, so these are 
really time and, and, and work like challenging events to, to do these necropsies. So my hat's off to everybody who partakes in those because they're not easy. The primary things that we found so far where starvation was quite common, we found quite a lot of ship strikes actually, and that many of the whales had a very high parasite burden um, in the form of whale lice. And you can see that over here in the picture on the right, there's a barnacle right here in the middle. And then all this pink stuff around that barnacle are whale lice, which are a form of isopod. Um, and it's not unusual for them to have these parasites, but when they have them in high, very high burdens, it usually means that there's a health problem. So this is an example, I'm sorry, I forgot to give you my disclaimer. There'll be some, um, some rather, um, hopefully not disturbing, but just some, literally some gross necropsy and not by gross, I don't mean you, by gross, I mean large animal. <laughs> so, um, so when a whale washes ashore like this one, you, you have no idea really, unless you see lacerations or something on the outside, you really don't know what's going on. So with a ship strike, you really have to open them up. Um, it will not be obvious from the outside that it was struck by a ship unless there's propeller marks. Almost every time with ship strikes for these animals, it's usually blunt force trauma. So you can see this is the gray whale's head over here. You can see like some little scratches and dings and things like that. But this vast area right here is all hemorrhage. So it's a ginormous, it's, it's not a bruise. It's too fresh to be a bruise. This animal also had fractured ribs and vertebrae. And many of these also have a fractured skull. There's nothing in the ocean that's big and strong enough to do that to a large whale except for a big ship. So, but we would not know this if we didn't do this necropsy and open up this tissue to see that. So that's how we determine ship strikes. So you can see the difference, obviously. I think it's very obvious that it's all this blood here versus the normal light pink blubber color over here. And actually this is quite a thin animal as well. So it's very possible that in this animal's case, it's poor nutritional state made it slow and less able to avoid a ship, for example. But with this much bleeding, this happened before that animal died. An animal that was already dead and got struck by a ship would not have all this active bleeding. So when you put all that data together and combine the 2019, 2020, and 2021 strandings, you can see that 2019 here in orange was still the worst. We still had it increased over the average as shown by these green bars here in 2020. And that was um, a challenge to get out there during the beginning of the pandemic and try to do these necropsies. We did the best we could. We, we got to most of them in our region. And then in 2021, we're still seeing increased numbers. Um, and we didn't see them early on quite as much like the last two years, but we saw them increase actually a fair bit in the summer. Um, we actually had one just not that long ago. <laughs> so, so they're still happening. So interestingly, remember this slide from earlier, remember we said the Eastern population is recovered and was about 26,000 in 2016. What's interesting is that since then, the population has dropped um, based on, on, on surveys to about 20,000 this year. And that's a decrease of about 25% of gray whales. That very similar decrease was noted after the 99-2000 unusual mortality event as well. So there's still a lot of questions that remain as far as what is going on with these gray whales. Um, the unusual mortality event is active. It has not been closed out. A lot of diagnostics remain. Um, we still have to analyze a lot of samples uh, for biotoxins, for infectious diseases, for chemicals, whatever we can. And if possible, obviously we would love to sample healthy animals, but that may not be possible. They're not always super easy to get to. Um, so it's unclear how much sampling of healthy animals we'll be able to do. But in the meantime, this is uh, active and ongoing and we love for people to report gray whale sightings um, and any other additional information that you have on the animals themselves, what they look to be doing, are they eating, are they breaching, are they, do they look pink, which means they're covered probably in parasites. All of that information is really helpful. So again, just a plug to everybody to keep, keep your ear to the, um, to the news reel. And obviously if we find any additional causes, we'd certainly investigate those. But so far, there has not been an obvious cause that's popped up as far as we know, but stay tuned. Alrighty, so that's gray whales and um, that's only just a teeny tiny bit of their story, but, um, but it's, it's active. So while we're on the, the subject of unusual mortality events, I thought I'd tell you a little bit more about Guadalupe fur seals because 
they are currently experiencing an unusual mortality event as well. Um, so this is another species that was thought to be uh, extinct by the 1900s due to overhunting. And it was that they were actually rediscovered um, in 1948, just a teeny tiny little colony of probably just a few dozen um, off of Guadalupe Island, off a couple of hundred miles off the coast of Mexico. Um, at this point, they are improving, um, but in Mexico, they're still considered endangered. And in the USA, they've achieved um, a threatened status uh, under the definition of the Endangered Species Act. Bad cat, oh my God, he's sharpening his claw. Bad, oh, sorry. <laughs> That's my sofa, dude. Um, so sorry, it's like, pay attention to me. Um, anyway, so, so sorry, the population is actually increasing from the 1950s. In 2010, the estimate was about 20,000 animals and most recently, just a few years ago, it was thought to be about 32 to 38,000, probably settling somewhere around 33, 34. They tend to hide out in caves and things, so it can be a little bit difficult to get a really good population assessment. Sorry, I, I can see that my face is really dark and then light. <laughs> Don't know what to do about that. Um, so Guadalupe first hill life history, they breed and uh, have their pups and raise their pups almost entirely on Guadalupe Island. And in this map, you can see a little bit here. So here's, here's our entire coast. Here's Baja, Mexico. Guadalupe Island is just here, probably maybe right about there um, off the coast of Mexico. And um, there are small rookeries on uh, San Benito and in San Miguel, which is a channel island. Um, San Benito's uh, another small island off closer towards the coast of Baja, San Miguel's in the channel islands. But those are pretty negligible. There's maybe no more than a couple hundred animals at each site. Um, similar to California sea lions, pups are born in June and they stay with their mom for about nine months. Uh, Guadalupe fur seals are pelagic because fur seals, most fur seals tend to be pelagic. So that just means they spend months out at sea foraging, but they're not really considered to be migratory species um, per se. And I'm not sure what the distinction is exactly for distinguishing migratory versus non, but they do spend a lot of time moving around. So this is a rather historic map. So based on fossil records, um, skulls and everything that probably Cal Academy has some of these, um, this green area is the range that Guadalupe fur seals um, are historically noted to have um, existed over. So really it's the entire Eastern Pacific coast here, all the way from much further south in Mexico, all the way up to Canada. And we still find them there to this day, but in much, much fewer numbers than they used to be. So as fur seals, they love a uh, squid, probably about 70% of their diet, um, based on some great ongoing studies is different squid species but they're also somewhat opportunistic and will eat some rockfish and lanternfish, mackerel and some other things. So in January of 2015, uh, there was a huge increase, an eight fold increase of Guadalupe fur seal strandings that was higher than their historical average. So remember, mind you, it's a small population. We don't see them too often. Um, and this happened to overlap with a 2013 to 17 young California sea lion unusual mortality event. And probably all of you remember the blob and, and marine heat waves and everything, um, that nightmare that was 2015. Um, but young California sea lions started stranding in increased numbers before then in 2013. Um, but we didn't see increased Guadalupe fur seal strandings at the time. But then they both started all coming in together. And almost all of these animals, the vast majority were very young, um, usually about six months to two years of age. With, with most of that clustering around the nine to 12 month old age group. There were a few juveniles and a few adults, um, but most strandings occurred between March and July, again, coinciding with those younger animals that were between nine and 12 months of age. You can see here's a very sad little fur seal who happened to be entangled in some fishing net, which we did see a number of those come in like that. So again, another graph courtesy of Noah. Um, Here's the historical Guadalupe fur seal stranding average. So literally one, two, or three, or maybe five, not even 10 per year. Um, and that holds true for going back many, many years. And then 2015, bam, we got a hundred of them just here in California. Um, and it seemed to decrease. And then we thought it was maybe done like, okay, maybe it totally coincided with the sea lion pup. Then boom, 2019, we saw another huge spike. And then last year, and then this year, we're still seeing increased numbers as well. 
interestingly enough, we did see an increased number in Oregon and Washington as well. Um, there's those two states at the same time, but then that seemed to sort of maybe settle out too. Again, those weren't huge numbers, you know, 10 to 20 or so, but then boom, again, 2019, this huge leap in these numbers that were stranding in Oregon and Washington. And those numbers remain high to this point. So what have we found so far in these Guadalupe fur seals? Um, so remember our pie chart from before um, about causes. Most commonly, almost every single Guadalupe fur seal strands with malnutrition. They're really, really skinny, super sad. Many of them have parasitic and or bacterial infections, but those don't seem to be driving their strandings. Um, the parasites, it's very common for marine mammals to have parasites. Young animals often have hookworms or maybe some tapeworms, maybe some lungworms, but most of them aren't suffering horribly from that or from bacterial infections. Trauma and entanglements are not uncommon. But again, that's not the primary reason that we seem to be having them wash ashore. Many of them have this kind of funny alopecia, which is basically, alopecia just means hair loss. And in these squads, it seems to be very um, common to see guard hair loss specifically. So they're, they have a very dense, um, tight undercoat of fur, and then these guard hairs are a little bit longer. So they look kind of patchy and, and a little raggedy. Um, but again, probably not a major impact on them. And then we've seen in a number of them that they also have a low red blood cell count or anemia. Um, but again, that's just a kind of a subset. And we, we see that not uncommonly in other animals um, that might just be a manifestation of chronic disease and poor nutrition. So we've investigated, you know, do they have infectious diseases? Are there viruses? Are there bacteria that they're riddled with? And we haven't really found a smoking gun there. What about biotoxins? You know, we have this weird marine heat wave. Um, overlapped with the sea lions, lots of DA uh, or demoic acid, um, lots of shenanigans in the water, but we haven't really found any one thing that seems to point to why we see them in such high numbers. So we really didn't know too much about them. Our, our colleagues in Mexico are doing wonderful research with them. Um, and so some of our team have been fortunate and um, worked very hard to go work with them. And one of our amazing scientists, Dr. Tanaya Norris, um, she has spent a lot of time working with our colleagues in Mexico to um, attach satellite tags and track where these animals are going. And maybe so we can hopefully find out a little bit more about what they're doing. So we tagged and tracked both animals that underwent rehabilitation here with dozens of our animals tagged and tracked on release. And also um, over multiple years, Tanaya and uh, our colleagues in Mexico have tagged and tracked animals from Guadalupe Island to see where they're going. You can see just how far they are ranging, not just the adults, but the juveniles as well. And we know that because they strand as juvies, um, but they're going north and south. So there's not, there's not a specific direction or route that um, any particular age group or sex seems to go. So it's all still a little bit unclear, but we're learning lots more about them. Um, there's active studies that are ongoing. Um, uh, with a recent review of their status, so remember they're considered threatened in the United States. Um, this, uh, uh, a recently a review was undertaken to see if they had recovered enough to update their status, upgrade them. And the findings were that National Marine Fisheries found that Guadalupe fur seals still face an elevated risk risk of extinction, and mostly because as a single population, they only have one main rookery. And so if something were to happen to that main rookery, it could still wipe out the species, basically, if, if the breeding rookery was so affected. Um, so their recommendations are to continue to support current research of these fur seals, lots of ways to do that, and they encourage stranding response to continue rescue and rehabilitation of sick or stranded animals to continue to study um, what they're doing, where they're going, and what things might be going on with them. So this UME, again, it's ongoing, um, but we think uh, there are signs that it's wrapping up. Um, we've uh, conducted a lot of studies. We've conducted a lot of necropsies. We've released a lot of animals. Um, it's been a privilege to be able to work with these little guys and get to know a lot of the um, folks in the field. And we have a long ways to go. You can see these little these two little rehabilitated fur seals running back to the water. This is a satellite tag that's attached to them. It's very, excuse me, it's very small because um, these animals are quite young, but it does give us um, a sense of where they're going. 
additional studies would be ideally would give us data on you know how deep they're diving how long they're diving what they're foraging for and i think some of those studies are proposed and um, hopefully will continue to take place so so that's a little a little guadalupe first seal story um and i forgot i think sarah you were going to tell me if there were um, any questions in the chat and i also forgot to check you on time how are we doing on time where are we with time? Let me just see. It's 720. Um, and so, uh, you know, up, up to you if you want to hang out and answer questions at the end here, if you're all right with that, or if your um, voice is tired and you need to get a good night rest so that you oh, can gosh. go take care of, so that you can make sure to go take care of my little Guadalupe first seal named chicory that we wrote chicory chicory yeah. i have time and i'm a talker so i'll talk at you guys as long as you let me um okay. so when you need me to stop though you just, just let me know probably generally people kind of wind down around 6 30 or an hour so 7 30 7 45 will will allow people to leave um or stay for for more with questions with you so that's that's okay. great yeah that's good cool. and, all right well let's jump over to california sea lions because this is another hot topic um uh talking about cancer in california sea lions um so just to give you a little bit of background uh, about cancer and wildlife, it accounts for about 10% of both human and wild animal deaths. And you would think it'd be more in people, but, um, and we're not totally sure about these numbers in wildlife in general, but it's sort of a, a rough estimate. Very few wild animal species have consistently the same type of cancer. Um, and there's one mammal, these Tasmanian devils, um, that has this ridiculously high, incidence of devil facial tumors and it's a virus actually that's highly contagious and this cancer is basically transmitted through biting and direct transmission of this virus and it's almost wiped out this um this species where it currently only exists in tasmania although it seems like they are mounting some sort of maybe there might be some improvement and some decrease in the in the death rates but it's very very brutal um there were a, quite a huge number of deaths of beluga whales in the St. Lawrence estuary between the US and Canada back in the 70s, 80s, 90s. Um, and a lot of those animals had intestinal cancer um, and it appeared to be associated with pollution. And that those incidents of cancer really reduced once the pollution and um, pollutants were mitigated and there was a lot less dumping into the St. Lawrence. And so these days we're not seeing nearly as many belugas dying of cancer as we used to, but it still was an elevated rate. Um, so those were two examples in, in wildlife, but most of their wild species, they get whole of a diversity or array of different kinds of cancers. It's not usually just one. Um, and just it's important to note that human activities can strongly influence the prevalence of certain types of cancer. So chemical pollutants, radiation in the form of nuclear radiation, but also solar radiation, um, due to holes in the ozone layer, for example. And then of course, effects on genetic diversity from humans selectively uh, eliminating certain species or types of certain species, et cetera. So we can have a big impact. So in California sea lions, um, we've noted for decades, again, sorry for the um, very um, possibly disturbing photo, but this is what we see. And, and many of you have seen these animals strand like this. What we see is uh, for the last few decades is a lot of sea lions present with prolapsed or um, tissue that's outside of their body, usually reproductive tissue. So it's usually in the females, it's often the uterus. And you can see that this is actually the uterus right here. Um, it obviously should not be outside the body like that. Um, in males, the penis um, might also be prolapsed or outside the body. Sometimes it's not that obvious. Sometimes we just see swelling of their back flippers, their hind limbs. Um, and sometimes paralysis um, because the nerves are, are, have been affected and are no longer functioning. Sometimes we'll see none of those things and we'll just see a lot of fluid in the abdomen. So they'll look very distended. Um, and most of these animals do have malnutrition, um, most likely from chronic wasting. And because they feel so lousy, they're no longer eating. But just like, you know, everybody knows somebody with cancer who's had cancer and you know that cancer cachexia or wasting is a very common presentation. So we've documented these for decades here at the Marine Mammal Center and our other stranding partners. But we see in our range is where we see a lot of these animals, especially these adult females, um, because that's kind of where they're coming. 
And overall, over time, over the last few decades, this has affected up to 25% of our stranded adults and subadults. That is insane. That is not normal. Um, if you consider 10% of wildlife with every kind of cancer under the sun, and we've got 10% of our stranded adults with this cancer, that is very, very abnormal. It always originates in the reproductive tract, and we call it urogenital carcinoma. Technically, it should be probably genital, but at first we didn't know if it was originating in the urinary system, genital system, or both. So it still sort of has that name, urogenital carcinoma or UGC. So again, here's some kind of rough looking photos. This is often what we see. Um, and I believe this animal actually stranded up in your rare region in the North Coast. So in this animal, you can see there's a lot of swelling. There's some edema or swelling of these hind flippers. And there's a lot of um, swelling of the tissues around the perineum. So both around the vulva in a female um, and possibly even around the rectum. When you open an animal, this is not the same animal, but here you can say the same thing. There's prolapsed tissue right here. Um, and in this animal, actually the cancer was so bad, it was completely compressing the bladder, the urethra that goes from the bladder to external. And the bladder had just completely filled with urine that was backing up. So really, really nasty, very painful, very uncomfortable for these animals. In males, you can end up with something along these lines. So uh, you might see the, a prolapse in this animal's case. This part of the penis was stuck out of the body, um, also causing a lot of pain and distress. And I believe in this animal also, the bladder was somewhat obstructed. You can see he's got some swelling back here around the scrotum. And this is the kind of lesion, it's called a plaque that we might see on the tip of a penis. So it might be a little bit subtle, but this is almost certainly the origin of the cancer in this animal. In females, we almost always see it originate in the cervix. So this is a normal, healthy reproductive tract. So down here is the vulva, down here on the bottom, uh, the vagina vault, the cervix is here. Here's the bladder kind of pushed off to the side and opened up. And then up here, just to the left and to the right are the uterine horns. And here are the ovaries cut in half, opened in half on, on, on the half shell, so to speak. So this is an animal with cancer and you can see there's a big difference in the tissue here of the cervix and see how this is pretty smooth, these folds. This is very rough um, and there's some enlarged lymph nodes up here. Um, here's a close up of that. You can see how rough and irregular it looks. So how do we diagnose cancer? So obviously if you have a sea lion like the one in the picture with a uterus hanging out, it's probably a slam dunk. It's either cancer or some other truly horrible disease. But not all of these animals have prolapses or flipper swellings. And it's really critical that we distinguish cancer, which is a non-treatable disease, from a treatable disease like leptospirosis, a bacterial infection, or something else. Um, there are no cancer tests in the blood or urine for these animals. So the only way we can really tell is by using ultrasound. So this is our most important tool as veterinarians. And this is our current veterinary fellow, Dr. Michelle, doing an ultrasound on this animal. We're also taking some x-rays here, it's our x-ray machine, um, because there is a little flipper swelling. But again, that could be from some sort of bony infection. So again, very important for us to distinguish the cause of these animals stranding, especially when they're skinny. So um, we're looking for masses in the abdomen with the ultrasound, and we're looking for changes to the kidney, the ureter, the bladder, or even the uterus. So you gotta be good, very familiar with normal anatomy and, and certainly become a bit of a, um, bit of a, a, a highly skilled with the ultrasound, which is not super easy. So just to show you a little bit of what we might see. So here is, this is a normal kidney over here on the left. This is what it looks like um, grossly or in real life. And this is what it looks like on the ultrasound. So this outline, it might be a little bit hard to tell, it's all different shades of gray, but that's why it's sort of a, it's both an art and a skill. Um, so this little white strip here represents the outside of the kidney or the capsule. And then this is the inside of the kidney. So for comparison, this is a kidney from an animal that had leptospirosis. And you can see like, it's really these little raniculi, these, these are like little kidneys within the kidney. They're all kind of big and swollen and angry looking. And that has a very distinctive appearance on ultrasound. So I think you can, you don't have to be a specialist to see the difference between this one, normal one here on the left, and a weird looking left of the kidney on the right. So that's a little subtle though. 
It's not, that's not, you know, it takes some time and experience to read that. But what we see with cancer is not subtle. What we see with cancer is big, very distended kidneys with all this dark stuff inside the kidney is fluid. So again, here's the outline of the kidney here. And this dark stuff represents fluid, in this case, urine that's backed up into the kidney. And that's because this black snaky thing is also urine. This is a ureter and the ureters transport urine from the kidney to the bladder. And when it gets backed up, when the bladder gets blocked and the urine backs up, it causes this, this kind of thing, hydro ureter. And you can see that on this animal. When we open it up, you can see that the kidneys look very different. There's all these kind of pocketing. This is where all the urine was, gonna, was backing up and causing this pattern. This is the exact um, this is the exact ultrasound of this kidney. So this is what it looks like opened. This is what we see on the ultrasound. So that's, again, it's not a slam dunk, but it's almost a guarantee that that's cancer. And you can also see in this, this is a really big lymph node that uh, the cancer has metastasized to. And then here's the uterus. It's also very thick and very angry and very sad. And here's one ovary and here's the other. So this is a very, very unhappy abdomen. And obviously euthanasia was the kindest thing that we could do for this or any animal that's this affected by cancer. So this is a huge concern. And this is something that Dr. Francis Gulland and many, many others have been studying for decades um, to prove and to find a cause and an association with these cancers. They're always the same. So the most recent study that just came out last year is, is it's, it's the proof, the sort of the final proof, which we've known for years that these cancers are associated with this herpes virus called Odorine herpes virus one. And they're made worse and associated with these pollutants, specifically PCBs, DDT, and a whole bunch of other chemical names that I personally cannot pronounce. Um, it's, it's replete, like this is absolutely true. So almost every sea lion that had cancer, herpes virus was found. But when you add in the pollutants, that was also a slam dunk, basically, for cancer. So it's uh, very well known, very well established that a multitude of chemicals can induce cancer through different ways. They can directly damage DNA, can suppress the immune system, disrupt our endocrine system, resulting in continued activation of receptors that wouldn't normally be activated. Or, or act as promoters or promote um, cell division reproduction in an abnormal way. So there's lots of ways that this can happen. And this is something that we still don't really know how these two things together are resulting in these very high cases of cancer, but this is absolutely fatal disease in these animals. We've made a lot of progress. This was a accumulation of decades of work, um, but we still have a lot to learn. Is it going to go away anytime soon? No. Herpes virus is in the environment and even worse, DDT, for example, this has all just hit the news, especially over this last year. Um, there are massive dump of DDT off of Southern California. And this is certain, almost certainly where these sea lions are primarily getting exposed. So if you remember their life history, California sea lions primarily reproduce in the Channel Islands. And during or after World War II and for decades after that, DDT barrels were dumped offshore. And so you've got this um, multitude of barrels that have been dumped that are constantly contributing to pollution in the environment of DDT. So even with cleanup, it's not gonna go away. Uh, so really disconcerting, oops, so sorry. Um, I think I don't have time, but there is, if you Google uh, LA Times did a, a huge um, sort of representation of this story. So definitely encourage you if you wanna learn more to, to check that out. All right, so that was a real bummer and I know we're out of time, but I just wanna show you happy little sea otters really, really quick. Um, so we can end on a upbeat note. <laughs> so I'm, I'm gonna zip through this super quick and then I wanna want give you a minute or two to ask questions if you have any. Um, Seattle's, if, if that's okay, is that okay? Yeah. No, I wanted to tell you, take your time. Don't, don't okay. rush. We'll, we'll, okay. If people need to leave, they can go. Um, okay. I think you have an, an audience that is enthralled here. Um, <laughs> so don't, don't feel you, like you have to speed talk. 
Okay. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. guys. I tend to no, talk too much early on and then. No, it's fast. All right. Well, let's let's talk about sea otters because there are some there are some positive things with otters that we can note upon. Um, so these are the smallest and kind of most odd marine mammal because they're fully dependent on their fur coat to be a marine mammal as opposed to most other marine, marine mammals that have blubber. Um, and sadly, again, this was another species that was hunted to near extinction and the population is now very fragmented. So we have three subspecies of otter. Here in California, we have our Southern sea otters. And then along here, Washington, around the Aleutian uh, Islands, we have the Northern or Alaskan sea otters. And then further uh, east, or sorry, west, um, are the Russian sea otters along the Kamchatka Peninsula and down towards Japan. And otters are important because they are a keystone species. They're not just little cutie pies. They're actually, in fact, they're incredibly mean and aggressive, but um, they are an apex predator. They have very high site fidelity and they have a very strong influence on kelp forests and marine grasses. And when you have otters, this has been uh, multiple studies have now shown, when you remove otters, you end up with these, especially these sea urchin barrens, where sea urchins kind of go a little crazy and overgraze these kelp forests. When the otter population recovers or is reintroduced, you end up with a much healthier ecosystem. This is a very simplified <laughs> diagram of what happens. Um, but without a doubt, sea otters have a very positive influence on our kelp forests and our grass, our marine grass estuaries. And um, Elkhorn Slough is a wonderful example of that. Um, so because of that, um, one of our big concerns in the world with climate change is the, the mass deposition of carbon dioxide into our oceans, uh, which is our oceans, our water is a big sink for it. Um, and there you would have the ability with a lot of different algae and kelp and grass to convert some of that CO2 back into oxygen. Um, but of course, when you're missing a lot of that biomass, that changes our ability, the plant's ability to do that. So potentially huge ecosystem effects. Again, very simplified, so don't call me on that. Um, for sea otters that strand, um, the most common thing that we actually see are trauma from shark bites. Um, and we all know we love our great whites and we protect them and care for them. But they do tend to chomp on our little otters. That's not their preferred food. They like to eat our seals and sea lions. And that's what they're supposed to eat. And usually when they chomp on an otter, they actually don't eat it. They usually kind of spit it out probably because of otter bites them. Um, unfortunately, that test bite from a great white onto a tiny little otter, well, relatively tiny otter, is usually deadly um, because they just can't withstand that bite pressure. The sharks have a, they have a pretty powerful bite. Um, and then the wounds themselves can become infected. So if it doesn't cause like a pneumothorax or, you know, just completely crush the animal or if the shark doesn't consume it, often will, the otter will die of secondary causes after that. So parasites are another major issue, especially in young animals, acanthocephalins or thorny, thorny headed worms. Um, parasites are sort of a natural kind of thing, but sometimes they get a little out of control with these guys. And then biotoxins, uh, specifically demoic acid, are one of the main contributors to sea otter mortality, southern sea otter mortality. Um, and it causes both brain disease in the form of seizures, um, and as well as heart disease. Um, and that cardiomyopathy or heart disease has now been refined and defined as being one of the major contributors to sea, southern sea otter mortality. Pups get separated from their moms. There's lots of nasty infectious causes and the biggest ones there are protozoal infections. So toxoplasma and sarcocystis, both of these are um, single cell little protozoal parasites uh, that enter the water column and the otters eat them when they eat bivalves that concentrate them in their, in their um, gill and in their tissues. And then they like to go to the brain and cause an encephalitis, so pretty nasty. Um, causes the otters to have seizures or make them less um, wary and more likely to be predated on. And then especially in Southern California, um, from San Luis Obispo and further south, fungal infections due to coccidioides, um, also known as valley fever, is a big killer of otters too. So with sea otters, they're, um, they're definitely funny little marine mammals. Um, like I said, they totally depend on their fur coat. Um, if they fur coat is in bad shape, they'll get too cold. If it's in good shape, they can easily overheat. So we have to be really careful um, with them as we take them in and then care for them. They might need a lot of care initially. Uh, they might need help grooming, um, all of those things. 
Um, here's the sea otter displaying. I hope this will play for you. You can see that it's not because this is a slippery floor with ice. This otter is unable to really stand. Um, he's actually also blind. You can see his coat is actually in pretty good shape. He's actually been grooming pretty well. So it seems like it's a pretty recent decline because his body condition is pretty good and his coat's pretty good. So in this animal's case, this was one of those parasite infections. This was uh, sarcocystis that caused a very acute or very sudden encephalitis in this sea otter. Um, so again, the other big deal, sorry, I, I mentioned this earlier, their coat is really important. The other big thing about sea otters is they eat a lot of very expensive seafood, invertebrates, stuff that we really like, um, shrimp, clam, mussels, crab, et cetera. It's very, very expensive and their metabolic rate is really, really high. So they need a lot of food. So it's no small thing to enter into sea otter rehabilitation. They're also very active little weasels. Um, they love a lot of enrichment. They get into a lot of trouble really fast the second they're feeling better. Um, so we try to enrich their environment and give them fun and unique and novel things to do. Sometimes that's in the form of uh, things that they can wrap themselves in like fake kelp and sometimes it's food. So we'll freeze some shrimp or something or a treat in a, in a, you know, in a bucket of ice or in a tube and make, make a little fish sickle or clam sickle or something like that. Something for else for them to get into. Um, but they're very good at getting themselves back into trouble again when they're feeling better. And then when we release them, it's really important that we track, uh, tag them and track to uh, them to assess their success. And unfortunately, anything that's on the outside of them, they'll rip off with their ginormous, vicious little teeth. So that means we have to implant um, tags into their abdomen. So these are two different tags that we can use to track them. One is a VHF radio tag, and the other, this one is called the life history tag. And we just did this in a handful of otters. Basically, the VHF radio tag is only good for maybe two years before the battery goes this life history tag will be good for um, more than a decade or so. And so we'll get a lot of information about the animal when it does eventually die. So I'm sorry, out of time to go too deep into that, but I just wanted to mention it. And on, on ending on a note of hope, um, sea otters have been very restricted, our Southern sea otters, um, by primarily one of the biggest things right now is sharks. So we have the Northern and the Southern ends of the range have very high shark concentrations, white sharks which makes it very hard for these sea otters to naturally expand both north and south. But there's a lot of interest in reintroducing them to other parts of the California coastline and Oregon and Washington. So the entire, our entire Eastern Pacific coast. Um, so there's a lot of promising movement. Obviously some, some individuals or some groups in the fishing community are very concerned otherwise about this. It can be potentially economically damaging. But um, there's definitely a lot of positives to potentially reintroducing sea otters, um, especially from an ecosystem health perspective. Um, so these are two things just kind of to note, the Alaka Alliance um, just released a feasibility study for the feasibility of releasing otters off of Oregon. And this is being expanded a little bit with fish and wildlife. Um, and there definitely has been some political support of reintroducing sea otters um, to additional parts of the Pacific coastline here. So, so on the positive note, um, it looks like things might, it will take time, it's not gonna happen overnight, um, but currently additional feasibility studies and assessments are underway along with a lot of talk um, to our local fishing community and a lot of other stakeholders to determine if it's something that we can make happen. Okay, so try to end it on a positive there. Um, but I just want to come back to this slide, um, and I hope that I've been able to impress on everybody the really the importance and the relevance of, of scientific research in association with marine mammal rehabilitation and all the things that we can learn from these animals. They're very important sentinels of many things that are going on out there in the oceans, many things that we have um, done, as you can see all the animals have highlighted today, were greatly impacted by humans in the past and or present and possibly future. Um, so I think it's incumbent on all of us to kind of think about um, how we continue to protect our natural resources at every level. Um, and uh, we have a lot still to learn from these little guys and big guys. So thank you so much. Um, again, it's my honor to chat with you tonight. I'm so sorry that I um, went a little over, I tend to do that. 
But if you do, if you're still here and you have questions, I will be happy to try to answer them. It's great. You, you know, people are saying, no, no, keep talking. And people that did leave said, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. And um, so much appreciation to you for talking for all of this time. And I, I would imagine you may get some questions at this point. So I think with this little intimate group of 15 of us, if you don't mind, well, you know, don't do don't 15 minutes or so. Sure. We'll let you go. But I'm just surrounded by angry cats. So they're fine. They're not going to get their dinner yet, no matter what. If, so, if you need to please. go, just no. scream and say, my cat's got my foot. So. <laughs> not at all. I'm very happy to try to answer any questions. Awesome. So if you do have a question, go right ahead and, um, and uh, unmute yourself. I think you can do that. Um, if not, you're welcome to put it in the chat. Um, if you, I'm just seeing much appreciation to you, Kara. And um, let's see if anybody wants to chime in or has any questions. By all means. Looks like no. We have a. Well, we all ask a question, I mean, and that is. Uh, um, is anybody working on doing some like chemotherapy or any kind of therapies, radiation, anything for cancers in marine mammal? That's a great question. And that's come up before. Um, and I think one of the areas that I'd really like to know more about is, is there a way that we can intervene earlier? So unfortunately, by the time most of these sea lions strand, the cancer has completely metastasized throughout their body. And there's... Yeah. Um, uh, trying to treat them at that point has really kind of not been an option. That being said, there are very likely animals that are stranding that have, that may have very early cancer um, before it's truly invaded and metastasized throughout the body. And there may be the ability for us to intervene at that stage. Um, unfortunately, it's very hard for us to detect those. So it's very possible that we get animals that come in have very early cancer it's 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 not the easiest thing to do i mean we could do we could scope um for example use a endoscopy to scope the reproductive tract of the females to look for a lesion in the cervix or something um that's something we could do uh the, if the ultrasound doesn't show obvious metastases or something but so far and there has been some interest from the human cancer community as to whether or not these animals might be a good model for treating certain cancers in people even, and that would benefit both people and themselves. So it's very similar to um, Epstein-Barr virus, which you might've heard of before in people that mm -hmm. can cause um, very similar disease. So I think that's a great um, uh, direction to try to go to, to see if we can intervene and help some of these animals. Um, but usually, unfortunately right now, by the time they strand, it's, it's very severe. Wow. <laughs> Charles uh, Burton, you had a question. You have your hand raised. Go right ahead. I do. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, great talk, by the way. Very, very interesting. Thank you very much. Um, so I was just curious if I heard you correctly, why domoic acid mediated mortality events were particularly prevalent in the southern sea otter population? And in a related question, why uh, coccidioides infections are particularly prevalent in Southern California? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for coccidioides, um, that particular fungus is uh, ubiquitous in the soil. And so when we have very dry and especially very dry and windy conditions, um, the soil and the coccidioides gets blown out into the local waters. So that coincides very neatly with human cases of coccidioides, where we see um, people with coxi um, in, you know, commonly in the same kind of increase or spikes as we see with sea otters. So that's probably, it's not that the sea otters are necessarily predisposed to it or anything like that. It's just, a, it's literally a, a geographic um, condition, most likely. We do occasionally see sea otters up this way with coccidioides, but the vast majority come from or Southern California where it's more arid. Uh, for, I'm sorry, the other question was about democ acid. Um, so democ acid, um, so that's a tough one that we are, we've been documenting brain lesions and heart lesions um, due to democ acid and sea otters. Um, 
almost as long as we have in sea lions when we first described it in 1998. Um, but it hasn't been nearly as well studied, probably because there's only about 3,000 sea otters and you know a couple hundred thousand sea lions. So the, the sheer numbers are, are much higher for sea lions. So it's better studied in that species. But in sea otters, we're seeing a lot of cardiomyopathy. Um, so demoic acid binds to glutamate receptors in the conduction system of the heart. Um, and it causes what, what amounts to uh, a condition called car dilated cardiomyopathy. So usually it's the left ventricle and that's the part of your heart, the chamber of your heart that blood pumps your blood out to the, through your aorta to the rest of your body. And please forgive me if you know all that already. Um, when the heart gets affected, you're not able to pump that blood very well throughout the body. And then a diving mammal that depends on good, strong heart contractions can no longer dive very well. Um, and so they become exhausted. And in sea otters case, because they have such high metabolic rate, they have to continue to the dive. They have no reserves. So they run out of energy really quickly and succumb uh, to, to that pretty fast. Uh, when it affects the brain, same kind of thing. It affects the hippocampus primarily, which causes basically memory loss and seizures. So anytime a sea otter is hanging out in the water, has a seizure, it can either drown or be attacked by a shark, for example, or something else. So, um, so it's insidious, that disease is insidious in multiple ways, um, affecting both the physiology, ability of the animal to dive and its ability to remember, remember how to be a sea otter. So um, we recently were part of a study that looked at demoic acid, effects of demoic acid um, on the heart and also looked at heart contraction um, using a cardiologist and sort of describing a normal sea otter heart and then describing hearts of sea otters, uh, live sea otters with DA induced problems. And, and it's pretty profound in, in those cases. So, um, so I'm not sure if it's uh, like truly an increase in DA. It does seem to be harmful algal blooms are for sure on the rise. Um, the last couple of years we've detected a lot more demoic acid, but our systems for monitoring it are also better. So, um, but basically the, the, the records, the I don't want to, not the fossil, the, um, the particulate records. So this core sediment sample records, um, you can measure the different types of um, algae, uh, especially for silicates um, in the sediment layer. And over the last 20 plus years, there've been a huge increase in the populations of Pseudonychia, um, which are the species of algae that produce demoic acid, certain of those species. So that change is real. There's a lot more pseudonychia in the water column, which means there's a lot more of DA being produced out there. So that's a very real change in a recent one. Wow. Well, this just um, really uh, speaks to our connectedness along the coast and the work that Allison Louie is doing up there in Humboldt, responding to that. Allison is the northern stranding range or coordinator. So she and I kind of share the Northern Mendocino, Southern Humboldt area and respond to the dead stuff on the beaches. And, um, uh, and, and, you know, anyway, that's important work and we do what we can in the field. Um, and then also just to speak to the importance of reporting these um, either live or dead st uh, stranded marine mammals, because as you can see, so much can be learned from a stranded marine mammal. It's like a, a wealth of knowledge that comes through these animals that strand. And Kara is, is a great way kind of to, just to see the importance of all of that. Um, I've often run into people who say, why are you saving the sea lion? And if they only knew how much is learned from each, each animal that strands, it's just amazing. Um, so. Exactly. Yeah, yeah they all have a story to tell, even yeah. if it's a, ju just another malnutrition, there's always more to it. Right, exactly. And at the Noyo Center are different animals that are on the floor there that have, you know, ship strike our blue whale. She's just, she's not put together yet. Obviously, we need to have a building that will actually fit a blue whale in it. Um, working towards that, that goal. One day we will have that. Um, but we have the dolphin with Brucella that, that um, went down for necropsy at the Marine Mammal Center and then we requested to get her back. Um, 
uh, different, all sorts of different stories that that are that come out. And Cara and I were talking earlier about a harbor seal that I um, picked up the skull the, the, uh, from an animal that looked like it had entanglement scars. And then once the skull was all cleaned, there was a stingray barb in the in the sinus cavity of that animal. So great stories, really fascinating because you know that if you want to study marine mammals, it's really hard because how much time are we land mammals going to be able to spend in the ocean? We know that it's very expensive and we're not that well adapted to being in the ocean to study them. So um, these stories are great, really important. Any other questions before we let Kara go feed her kitty cat? <laughs> that I can They're hear. Fine. They have to wait another hour or two until I go to bed. Oh. I see Paul had a question about um, the impact of orcas on Seattle population, Alaska, or, or in general. And Paul, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm afraid I don't know a huge amount of that because I'm not sure that we all know a huge amount, but I do know there's recently an orca that stranded that had about six or seven sea otters in its belly. Um, and that is a, a very legit and scary thought. We know that they'll, they'll pick off a whole bunch of harbor seal pups um, and uh, you know, harbor seal population seems pretty stable and probably able to sustain that. Although there's in increasing recent drops there too, but um, yeah, the sea otter, that's really concerning. So if the orcas are picking off the sea otters, um, that's that's a huge concern. The Alaskan sea otters are in much better shape, but it doesn't take much to knock them off their axis. And um, I'm not familiar with their actual studies yet, but if anybody else knows, I'd, I'd love to hear about them. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, some of the studies I've heard about in central Alaska, Aleutian chain, mm -hmm. is as the stellar sea lion population has gone down, yeah. the workers are adapting to different food sources. And so they've increased the number of otters they're taking. At least that's yeah. the concern from the, from the ADF and Alaska Fish and Game biologist. While yeah. over in Southeast Alaska, um, the sea otters are more protected and, and there's more stellar sea lions. So the orcas still go after the stellars because they get more bang for their buck, so to speak. Absolutely. I didn't know what the orca population is down in California. I've heard uh, when orcas show up, great whites sleep. <laughs> they book. <laughs> yeah, as soon as the first great white gets picked off, the rest of them, there's probably a chemical signal and they're out of there. They disappear. <laughs> So like, orcas nothing, are incredible. I've, yeah, and I have nothing against orcas, but they are, you know, with the exception, obviously, of our local J-Pod, um, our resident uh, salmon eaters, transient orcas and other orca groups are doing very well. It's also rather concerning because as the sea ice, melt, sea ice melts in the Arctic, orcas are making their way further north than they ever had, and they're, they're gobbling up some uh, belugas and some narwhal um, and some more ice seals that previously were a little bit more protected. So... There are definitely some very interesting population shifts that could be on us in the upcoming decade or so. Orca is doing incredibly well. They have nothing, no predators, and humans are very protective of them, which is fine as it should be. But um, they are definitely the most dominant predator out there, <laughs> without a doubt. And nobody can really, there's no animal, including great whites, um, that can withstand that. Um, it's, it's not just our coast in South Africa. I, I was there a couple of years ago and um, we went uh, to try to see some sharks and two orcas showed up um, named Port and Starboard because they each have a dorsal fin that bends to one side, one to the right, one to the left. So they're called Port and Starboard. And apparently their, their, their thing is to roam up and down the, you know, Cape Horn and up and down the south tip of South Africa and up and into the chewing on um, fur seals, but also sharks. They love to specialize in sharks. So they each grab an end of the shark, yank it apart and eat the liver. So they're, uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a specialty type of feeding for sure. And the great whites around here are like, oh no, 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 we're done. So uh, very interesting. I have a second question if I could. I, I teach at a vet school in East Tennessee, LMU. And um, a lot of our senior students are looking for rotations. Um, and one of our students is a Hawaiian uh, native She's out of uh, Maui. Are there options for vet students to do rotations at the, um, the Kona uh, hospital with the monk seal uh, facility? And if so, how do they contact? 
Um, so far, we don't have rotations yet. Um, that is something we may be able to do in future. Um, that hospital is still kind of small and growing. So we, we don't have too many animals there um, at a time. And most of them are malnourished young monk seals from the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. So they don't usually need a lot of medical care. They mostly just need good nutrition. So it means not a very, not a very exciting rotation for most veterinary yeah. students. Um, so it's, it's certainly in the realm of possibility in future. Uh, we've been talking about it and what that might look like. And maybe if we could arrange some sort of partner relationship with some of the other local um, vets or facilities that might make a, a rotation we might be able to build a, a good rotation that includes monk seals out there. Um, so, yeah. Are there options at Sausalito for vet yes. students? Yes, we take, um, in fact, we have a, a very <laughs> popular program and we we're able to take, our, our busy season is March through September and that's when we have our, our veterinary students. It's, um, I'm, I'm thrilled, I, I love our program. It's rather competitive and the students usually have to apply about a year and a half in advance. Um, so and our website is open now. We're taking applications for 2023 because next year is already filled. Okay. So yes, definitely check out our website under education and you'll see veterinary professionals there. Well, I plug the Marine Mammal Center all the time. <laughs> so I'll direct them to a Sausalito. Great. Well, we're, I'm, I'm thrilled that we have the patient load and the incredible resources to be able to, to teach as many as we can cram them cram. in. We do cram them in. <laughs> so what it's 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 a again it's it's a privilege to be able to share what we learn sure sure all right everyone well thanks again cara thank you uh peggy for for giving cara a call and thanks to everybody for joining us this evening we look forward to seeing you again and uh we'll let you go all right thank you all so all much and hope to see you again soon thank you